You ready to go? Yeah. All right. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. I am honored to have back Dr. Lawrence Heller. Lawrence, welcome back to the podcast. Nice to be here. Thank you. So Lawrence Heller holds a doctorate in clinical psychology. He was in private practice for 40 years. He developed the Neuroeffective Relational Model, or NARM. His book, Healing Developmental Trauma, has been published in 14 languages, and his model is taught throughout the world. He's a founder director of the NARM Training Institute and teaches regularly in the U.S. US and Europe. His new book, written with Brad Kammer, previous guest on this podcast, is titled The Practical Guide for Healing Developmental Trauma, Using the Neuroeffective Relational Model to Address Adverse Childhood Experiences and Resolve Complex Trauma. Dr. Heller, welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Nice to be here. You're welcome. So before we get going here, share with the listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Well, I was born in Denver, Colorado, uh, third generation on one side. So I have deep roots there in Colorado, but I'm, I've am i been living in the last for the last 20 years in Los Angeles, which uh, I enjoy too. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, for a big part of my uh, the last 20 years, I've been traveling like four times a year back and forth to Europe. So I'm, mm-hmm. I also feel very at home in, in, in Europe. So I'm kind of all over the place in some ways, but. So we're going to, we're going to talk about your book today. Uh, but I, before we do, I want to just, if we can give our listeners a uh, uh, kind of a thumbnail sketch of how did you get into this field in the first place? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I, really, it was curiosity. It was obviously like, I think a lot of uh, therapists, it was curiosity about what made me tick, curiosity about what made other people tick, uh, just really a, a deep desire to understand the depths of human experience, you know, realizing that there's much more than the kind of day to day, you know, living that, uh, you know, I was experiencing that I saw many other people experiencing and so I, I, as soon as I started doing some of my first experiential work in the field of psychotherapy, I was hooked. I mean, I knew that my very first actually exposure was I saw this guy doing a demonstration in Gestalt therapy. This was year, many, many years ago. Uh, and I was immediately fascinated. And By what specifically? <laughs> Gestalt well, is a fan, right? It's yeah, I, I was fascinated by... Uh, he was like, as they did at the time, he was working with this person's dreams. And um, by, by just the depth of the experience, it, it that, that depth uh, drew me. I, it wasn't so much until late. I mean, it wasn't until later, really, that I realized it was also looking for depth in myself. It was just more this kind of instinctive interest in in depth in you know uh, about myself about other people about human beings in general and, and so uh, it, one one thing led to another and um, here I am all these years later <laughs> so right but I mean you developed your own model right not everyone does that how did that come about <clears throat> well I think it came about from both so the successes and the failures that I experienced for me personally, and then for other people. And then later, even as a, you know, as I uh, got seriously into be, you know, uh, becoming a c- clinician, I, I just, I, I started to see that uh, there was, there were so many things that were useful and so many things that were exciting, particularly back in the seventies, you know, when there was all this new uh, energy for, for different ways of trying to work with human beings. It wasn't just the traditional behaviorism or the traditional kind of psychoanalytic work. And there wasn't much else out there, out there. Uh, I actually ended up starting the Gestalt Institute of Denver back clear many years ago and at that time, the only, uh, there was just what I was saying, there was the analytic institutes, there was, uh, you know, there was a little bit of TA, they actually opened up about their institute in Denver about the same time that uh, that I co-founded the Gestalt Institute. 
And then there was this traditional behaviorism, which uh, Skinner and n not not what we're talking about today, but but the real old fashioned behaviorism that we had at the you mm -hmm. know at the time, and that still is used in certain contexts for you know. But so that that's kind of the the sequence. And what about trauma? Your introduction to trauma. How did that come into play here? Well, I. I was working with it before we we used the word, and we have to remember how much this word has shifted, and how much how it really didn't exist mm -hmm. in the way that we use it now, even fifty years ago. So, trauma. If you said trauma, particularly to a physician, they were always they were always thinking medical or or physical trauma, mm -hmm. and then we of course with Vietnam War, and we started to you know begin to understand. Uh, what was traditionally called shell shock, or there were different words, but they started calling it, you know, PTSD. That became a, a diagnosis again over, I'm conflating what had took place mm -hmm. over many years. And so the word trauma at that point was specifically being used for what I differentiate now as shock trauma versus developmental trauma. Shock trauma being more single incident kinds of trauma or uh, not related specifically to the family, to relational trauma, to developmental trauma. And so I did, I was very involved in working with, with PTSD for, for a number of years, but I saw that the models for PTSD that were developing and that were out there really didn't deal with the more emotional and developmental kind of trauma that I had already been working with, but we didn't use the name trauma at the time. Mm -hmm. So I started, I, I began, you know, I, and I had been doing that work even consistently from the very beginning of my, you know, my career of addressing what we're now calling trauma, but then uh, started to understand more of the role of the body and the nervous system and other kind of other elements uh, through some of my exposure to you know, different shock trauma methods. And I just felt that there was a big gap between uh, shock trauma and working, you know, the self-regulation models that were developing and that I was a part of myself in the earlier years uh, and what we needed to address in terms of human development and what we, you know, what we now call complex PTSD or developmental trauma, and that there were other tools that were needed. People were actually being missed, and and then I also saw the, you know, an experience because I I tried many different things in a serious way, not just dabbling. You know, I, I experienced that other techniques like there was a, a, a lot and I consider myself psychoanalytically and psychodynamically informed, but there was a lot that was being missed in mm -hmm. that process, particularly uh, in the early years, the, the relationship of the body in all of this, there was no, there was very little talk about the body except in maybe in terms of conversion reactions or, you know, mm -hmm. the, the languaging that we used at the time, but not realizing what I, what I talk about in NARM as the functional unity between the psychological and the physiological. And I and that seemed to me to be an important distinction. There were some elements of that in the body-oriented psychotherapies that I was exposed to in like in the 70s, mm -hmm. right? Different kinds of Reiki traditions and bioenergetics and many other body works were being developed. I, I was, you know, very much involved in the early years of rolfing, not as a rolfer myself, but as as somebody who had their body worked on uh, mm -hmm. many times by and found that all of this together m made a more effective approach to working with people than just focusing on, you know, ideas or beliefs or just focusing bottom up, trying to regulate nervous systems, that these were useful mm -hmm. elements, but they didn't cover the whole spectrum of what we need to address with developmental trauma. And then, of course, in the 90s, we had the ACEs study that uh, that came out and that gave a language and a name for things that many of us as clinicians had already understood but it created a different awareness in the in the public uh, over time it took a little while for it to gain traction mm -hmm. strange thing 
uh, just to mention, because I do spend so much time in Europe, is that the Europeans have not uh, talked very much about ACEs and are not in many experienced clinicians are not even aware of it it's mm. different in different countries depending on where you are but still uh, where it's such a common reference point for you know clinicians in the u.s and not so much yet in mm -hmm. in europe which I, I found intriguing but that that was all part of the development that you know that was both personal in terms of my own personal awareness as well as my the work that i was doing with other people but it was also a general understanding in the field that was developing that there's mm -hmm. something else that is needed then you know with uh, aline lapierre back in well it's been about 14 or 15 years ago she to, together i had started a book and worked with a professional writer and you know was trying to put together a book on developmental trauma and then never was was able to quite get it together in in terms of the way I wanted it to be. And then Aline helped me to really uh, finish and and round out that that book. And the interesting thing was that um, there was on on that in that book that I talked about the importance of how trauma, and then I was mean at that point, developmental trauma affects uh, on autonomic and emotional regulation, how it affects what we now call talk about as self-image and as we talk about and it affects a person's capacity for relationship mm -hmm. so years after that when uh, you know when they when cptsd became part of the international you know became an official diagnosis internationally those were the three points uh, the the same three points that they used to make a, a distinction between developmental trauma and shock trauma and so uh, really it, you know and i said too that you know i i learned from a lot of mistakes in like in the in the 70s there were a lot of uh, cathartic the, the the somatic psychotherapies were exciting and thrilling and emotional and and dramatic and uh not always helpful sometimes they were but not always helpful but i saw that regressive work was often very destructive to many people mm -hmm. and so i started seeing yeah I, and and i didn't see the need for it but the, you know like the the deep breathing and hitting pillows and kicking and and all of that didn't seem to help a lot of people in mm -hmm. the way that it might have so i started you know in as my in my journey just kind of picking and choosing uh what elements that i saw as the most helpful that we needed to pay attention to the body my first my you know my first exposure was to gestalt which was uh, is was and is considered an existential psychotherapy mm -hmm. narm itself is also existential in that we work in the present moment and then i saw this this really important element that is really a, a core piece of NARM, which is that um, how to bridge that gap between what happened in the past to the symptoms that people experience in the present. Now, for some highly integrated people, just becoming aware of what happened in the past helps them change what's going on for them in the present. But mm -hmm. that doesn't work for a lot of people. And so what I came to see is that it isn't so much about doing the, an archaeological expedition into the past. It's not so much what happened to us, but the various adaptations that we made in order to survive and, and that develop into what I call in NARM the adaptive survival styles. It's these, these adaptations that once saved our lives mm -hmm. that now as adults... Um, create the the symptoms and then i started looking you know at even more deeply at this broader theme of, of, of psychotherapy and like there was anna freud and her long list of defense mechanisms which was very useful and you know part of the development of psychoanalytic understanding but then i started to ask myself well what is the common denominator here between all of these so-called uh, defense mechanisms and then I, I saw that really what we're talking about here is various aspects of disconnection. When life gets too painful, when 
emotions get overwhelming when needs basic psychobiological needs don't get met then we use various kinds of strategies and mechanisms to disconnect and i saw that connection and disconnection was a, a fundamental theme that i i started to address more directly and actually the original title of the, my very the very first book uh, that I wrote was on shock trauma with Diane Poolheller, and then this second book with Aline Lapierre on developmental trauma was seeing that um, the specifics of how the adaptations that we made, which once saved our lives, now are, as I mentioned a moment ago, creating the the symptoms, and uh, what that then led me to see is that when we get goal oriented when we're trying to create change for the client we're almost by definition going to miss them mm. and that that's actually a profound paradigm shift when we really look into that can you give us an example there because that's very interesting okay well so for example many therapies, uh, not just the traditional somatic psychotherapies, but some of the analytic psychodynamic therapies saw, for example, that the client had a, a lot of anger. They were caring, they were, they were just dealing with a lot of anger that they weren't aware of, that maybe was coming out in, in, in the form of bodily symptoms or depression or anxiety, that it expressed itself in a variety of ways. And so they had this idea, and many still do, that the idea then is to get people into this anger and to feel it and to get it out. Uh, it's again, that idea is a little less popular these days than it once was, but it's, and I saw again, that trying to get people, for example, into their anger was actually dangerous and disrespectful because people disconnected from their anger or their needs or what their, their bodies for a reason. And, <clears throat> It's more important to explore the so-called resistance. In other words, what's getting in the way of us being healthily connected to our anger and aggression and to our needs and to our bodies and to explore the obstacles that we have, the learned obstacles mm -hmm. that are now in the way of that kind of deeper connection that is the birthright for all of us. And so instead of trying to get somebody to be connected, we sh I shifted it to let's explore the various ways that a person, you know, has disconnected and feels that they need to continue disconnecting. And, and ultimately, I came to the understanding that so much of this, so much of what is driving the fear of connection that we all want, ultimately, in, in the ver ver variety of the variety of ways that we experience a connection to ourselves, connection and in intimate relationship to some, for some people, for something greater than themselves, is that what's, you know, what's driving all of the, this is fear, is that if the, the idea is, is that if we give up these so-called defense mechanisms, these adaptive survival style mechanisms, as I call them, that something worse will happen. And what, Really, what what I came to understand and <laughs> is that there's what in Narm I talk about as the core dilemma, where the child will actually give up what's most authentic and most real, most alive in themselves, in order to protect the attachment relationship with the parents, and that's an essential aspect of of developmental trauma, and. As a child, it made sense, of course, to give that up. But we continue in these patterns, you know, foreclosing aspects of ourselves and even ending up hating aspects of ourselves as part of that foreclosure, which is ultimately a way of trying to protect the attachment or love relationship with the parents, even if the parents are long dead. I mean, the no. fantasy continues. And so <clears throat> I started putting all of these elements together and step by step uh out of that came norm i mean it's it's incredible to hear you uh 
talk about this your process because it it's i mean am i hearing you correctly and saying because it seems to me like a subtle difference we're talking about you're talking about the anger there's this need for some people to get some, a, a client to express their anger but you're saying rather than that find out what's inhibiting that expression in the first place when when it when people are for example having symptoms of of unintegrated anger, which can be a whole variety of different things. Yes, then I'm saying it's more important to explore the fear of the anger. And then that then when, when the fear of the anger, which is always coming from a child consciousness place, what I call in our child consciousness, but, you know, unless people have really, you know, acted out if they have impulse control and the other issues come into play. But for the most part, what I'm saying is that, yeah, as people explore the fear of the anger and the confusion that many people have between anger, the emotion and anger, the be and anger, the behavior or the behaviors mm -hmm. of anger, then then what is needed, what is unresolved that the anger is trying to communicate can come to the surface, be communicated, but not through a cathartic method not through biting and kicking and mm -hmm. screaming it's you know all the kinds of things that we did in the 70s but <clears throat> in an embodied integrated way at the same time what norm is both top down and bottom up so not only just to feel the emotions but to understand what they have been trying to communicate to the environment because emotions are basically communications were and that's the way Infants and children, even before there's language, communicate needs and distress and other things to their parents. So the capacity to be able to feel and to integrate um, makes such a huge difference in people's lives, but we're not trying to get them to feel. Mm -hmm. That's our natural state. We're helping them explore the obstacles in the way to, to feeling more, to feeling their feelings, to feeling their bodies. And as they do that, they say, I don't need to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I can allow myself to feel I can, I don't have to keep running from myself because that's really a big part of what the, the, of the strategy that we've all used in terms of trying to deal or not deal with uh, various elements of whatever kind of developmental trauma we experienced is that we then end up running away from ourselves running away from our bodies, running away from our emotion, emotions, running away from intimate relationships. <clears throat> but again, we don't know what it is really, why we're so afraid. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> NARM is part of, and part of the exploration in NARM is, is exploring. And, and that's the way, that the very first pillar in NARM, uh, we, we talk, call it a, the contracting pillar, um, which can be a, confusing because it's not like we're actually signing a contract nor are we guaranteeing results because in psychotherapists we can't guarantee results but what we do in NARM is it's very important for the client to communicate what it is what their intention what it is that they're most wanting and the more they're able to communicate what it is they're most wanting on an emotional level rather than on a behavioral level <clears throat> the more effective that initial contract is and then the agreement between the therapist and the client is i'll be glad to, let's say they want to have more capacity for intimate relationship we, we can't promise that they're going to end up in an intimate relationship as therapists but what we can promise is that i'll explore what's getting in the way of you mm -hmm. having the capacity that you're wanting for intimate relationships or whatever it is i just use that as an example um, so the, your second book, the practical guide for healing developmental trauma, uh, how did that come about? Why did you write that? Who's it for? Well, it was written with Brad Cameron, who's the, <clears throat> my, my partner at the NARM training Institute and, and the director of training there. And we, <clears throat> we had been creating literally hundreds of webinars over We've been together, the Institute now, for about six years. And we saw that <clears throat> these webinars on a variety of different topics could were already the framework of a very mm -hmm. what we thought could be a very useful book where we could 
drill down more into the ver the the clinical techniques and the clinical understanding in NARM in a way that I didn't have the time or the opportunity to do in, in the same depth in the first book. The first book presents the developmental model, some overview and, and, some, and some detail about the various survival styles, and then um, a, a, an end of, at, at the end of each chapter on each one of the survival styles, some clinical orientation about how we help these individuals or individuals who are dealing with these dynamics move towards resolution. So the book with Brad is really the, the next step where we, the whole focus was, was on how do we help all of these dynamics and help people move to, to resolution, whatever that might mean in their, their individual life, uh, helping them, you know, finish, uh, what is unfinished from their hist history and become aware of the adaptations that they made that they don't, you know, to, to difficult situations in early life that they don't need to make as adults, that they have mm -hmm. to help clients see that they have many more options than they realized when they're viewing the world through a child's eyes, which we all do to a mm -hmm. certain degree. And so, you know, in terms of that whole piece of norm not being regressive, it's my experience that we're all regressed enough and that you know that we're all stuck in in different degrees in different ways in various kinds of developmental dynamics so it, it, there is a, actually we deal with what I, what I talk about as child consciousness but i don't talk about the inner child because i don't want to make that a thing there you know that's just a metaphor it's a construct mm -hmm. a way of understanding um and as those you know as clinicians get further into NARM, they see that in general, I tend to avoid n nouns in NARM. So I don't talk about, I mean, of course, people will come in, they'll, they'll be complaining about burnout, but I will then at some point when the timing is right, I'll say, well, let's, I'll be glad to explore with you how you burned yourself out on the, on your, your last job, let's say. And so that's beginning to address then the language of agency which is also a very important piece in arm in terms of how we've we've all internalized the environmental failure that we experienced as children and then carry it forward and repeat it uh, in a variety of different ways and a variety of different strategies as adults but that was a long-winded answer to your question about who's this for so we've we've written it obviously more for cl clinicians but just like with the with the first book which did very well in you know far beyond the the, the population of clinicians where this book is also for people who want more specific information about their own healing mm -hmm. and who are you know probably have had some experience in in different psychotherapies finding some things that help some things that different didn't work as well and so it's really for for various kinds of clinicians and other helping professionals who want to integrate a, a NARM informed, trauma informed understanding to their work, but also to the general public who are just interested in personal growth and personal development and relieving some of the suffering that they've experienced. So specifically, uh, we're talking about complex trauma here. Mm -hmm. Right in in the book, can you give us uh, as best you can, a, a, kind of a, an an example of of what a case might look like, how you deal with it in the book, kind of a snippet. Well, generally, people come into the therapeutic process because they're symptomatic. They're feeling, you know, it could be very specific symptoms, or it could be generalized symptoms. It could be anxiety or depression. It could be the breakup of a really recent relationship, and they're they're suffering, uh, you know, in the aftermath of that. So, we start with uh, with addressing that. What is it that's going on? What is it that's bringing you here? And what would you most want for yourself? That's the first pillar. Like, what is it that they're, you know, and ideally getting. Uh, something more than just symptom relief. <clears throat> so sorry, <clears throat> my uh, I'm I uh, 
Got something stuck in my throat here for a second. No worries. I'm assuming you can. Do you edit? We can this? edit this out. Yeah, there's oh, no worries. Oh, okay. okay. Need to cough or whatever. <laughs> okay, I did. I got it out of my okay. system. <laughs> so, um, so, and so, uh, are we ready to go? Are you recording? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So we'll start with where they are struggling in their lives right now. And then we begin to explore, you know, what the details of that struggle are. And the interesting thing, and what I think distinguishes NARM from other therapies, is that by staying so precisely in that phenomenological here and now kind of addressing their direct experience in the moment, that whatever has been unfinished from the past, instead of having to go look for it, it spontaneously emerges. Seriously, I mean, you have to see this, and I've seen it hundreds of times now, to see how spontaneous that is. But let's put it this way. <clears throat> we're, we're constantly working with this connection-disconnection dynamic in the here and now with clients. And we're just reflecting to them both when they're more connected and when they disconnect. And so there's a, a growing mindfulness or somatic mindfulness or aw increasing awareness of this connection-disconnection process. As soon as people start to become more aware of that and start to feel more connected, then what they've been disconnecting from tends to surface. And that tends to be often certain childhood memories or childhood experiences. The other thing that I think is important to remember about this general field of complex trauma is that we're not generally talking about specific incidents, although there may be some that are very important to, to address. But in general, what characterizes complex trauma is the chronicity of the, the process that it's often, you know, when we're talking about neglect, abuse, chronic misattunement, we're talking about dynamics that take place over years and years mm -hmm. and years. And so there's this chronicity piece. It's not like uh, being hit by a car, which is a single incident shock trauma. As terrible as it is, it's different. And there's another piece, which is that it tends to be relational, and then R in NARM stands for relational. It tends to be relational in the fact that often the perpetrators were members of the family, immediate or extended, Some often the parents or step-parents, so, you know, and this relational piece brings up the whole conflict that comes up for children, that to be angry at the person upon whom they're 100% dependent and with whom they have a love relationship, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to feel the protest, the anger, and even the rage that comes up when you've been mis treated or abused or neglected in some significant ways. And that dynamic doesn't automatically come up in shock trauma. So it's an important, one of the important distinctions that uh, is important for all of us as clinicians to understand. Wow. Um, as we kind of wind down here, mm -hmm. um, so the, I'm, I'm assuming the best way for people to get in touch with you is your website. There's the, yeah, there's the NARM <clears throat> Training Institute website, which is okay. the major website. I have my own website, which is more oriented towards the European teaching, but people can, uh, for the general U.S. Uh, and on and all of the online stuff, that's on the NARM Training Institute website, yes. Okay. My guess is mm -hmm. people are going to be listening to this, and just the way you're able to articulate uh, how NARM ad addresses uh, relational trauma is, is fascinating. My guess is people are going to want to uh, mm -hmm. learn how they can learn about NARM. Um, so I'm looking at your website now. You have trainings, you have seminars. Um, <laughs> these seminars listed all over Europe. My gosh. Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, so do you have online uh, things people can access? Yeah, we have. Yeah, we actually, it's only in the last number of months that we've gotten more back into in person trainings. We started off like 90, 90 some percent in person. And then, of course, COVID came. And like so many other people, we had to adapt. And so then, uh, 
at, at this point, we've still got a significant presence online. We've got this subscription program where people can get webinars and see demos, uh, you know, and they have regular access and new th- new material is coming on every month. Okay. So there's there's that. And um, that's the call. That's called the inner circle training. I uh, maybe I, I may may have I may have misstated. But then we've also got a, an online training program for people who are not psychother licensed psychotherapists. So we call that our OBT or online basics training. That's open to all helping professionals mm-hmm. who want just more norm based trauma informed. Uh, understanding for their own work, whatever that might be. So there's a, all different wel- helping profession, professionals are welcome in that. And then we've got our um, uh, what we call our level two, which is for licensed psychotherapists. And, and there we have, they get significant exposure to the basic techniques and uh, an overall understanding in our then uh, we've got a third year which has to do with working with what is traditionally described as personality disorders and then i teach this kind of ongoing uh webinar this is online called the postmasters where for those people and we get a lot of people who want to stay with this through the mm-hmm. process who can really take the want to take the time to go into a great deal of depth about the more difficult in, in, in areas of human experience and and i i call that that fourth year training the the primitive edge of experience because i'm really helping people learn how to work with very complex ptsd work with personality disorders and other kinds of major sources of of trauma we'll have everything linked up here at the show notes page at the trauma podcast.com uh, Dr. Heller's book, again, is called The Practical Guide for Healing Developmental Trauma, Using the Neuroaffective Relational Model to Address Adverse Childhood Experiences and Resolve Complex Trauma. And Dr. Heller, Heller I'm assuming that can be purchased anywhere. Yeah. We'll have yeah. it linked up here again. Yeah. Dr. Heller, it's been a while since we talked initially, but man, you, you're amazing. I mean, oh. you're so, you you can feel your experience and the depth of your experience and your ability to articulate the work you do is is really super inspiring so anytime you you want to come back here you're welcome okay i'd love to take care okay good